Good day, I'm Dr. Hannah de Guzman and I will be talking about imaging of the optic nerve head and retinal nerve fiber layer. I have no financial interest in any of the machines or products mentioned in this talk. Except for the photos and scan results of actual patients, the rest of the images from this lecture are from the websites of the manufacturers. So what is the role of optic nerve head and retinal nerve fiber layer imaging? Well, it's a structural examination, like the disc examination. But unlike the disc exam, it is objective and it's quantitative, meaning measurable. It serves as an adjunct to the primary structural exam, which is the clinical examination of the optic nerve head and retinal nerve fiber layer. And so its role is really as an adjunct in making the diagnosis and for monitoring for change. There are three commonly used imaging technologies, which are optical coherence tomography, confocal scanning laser ophthalmoscopy, and scanning laser polarimetry. There are examples of the various technologies shown on the screen. OCT is most useful for evaluation of the retinal nerve fiber layer and to some extent it's also useful for evaluation of the optic nerve head. On the other hand, confocal scanning laser ophthalmoscopy, such as the HRT, is much more useful for evaluating the optic nerve head. And scanning laser polarimetry is entirely for evaluating the retinal nerve fiber layer. This lecture will be mostly about the OCT because that's the most common machine locally. OCT uses a diode laser light source and it performs multiple A scans in rapid succession. It compares the reflections of the light returning to the scanner from the sample or the tissue against reflections returning from the reference mirror. So when there's a greater delay in the reflection, that means that the tissue being examined is thicker. The photo above is the stratus OCT and the photo below is the cirrus OCT. So an A scan, A stands for eggshell. So the OCT performs multiple A scans in rapid succession and then it plots these images or it analyzes these multiple images into an, a da data that is understandable to us. So this is a simplified diagram of how the OCT works. The low coherence light source, which is a super luminescent diode, sends a beam of light to the beam splitter. The beam splitter now splits the light into one going to the reference mirror and another beam going to the tissue or the sample. The light returning from the sample comes back to the beam splitter as well as the light returning from the reference mirror. These two light reflections are now sent to the camera or the detector and they are compared with each other and analyzed by the machine's software. The original OCT technology was called time domain technology, but the latest technology is the spectral or Fourier domain technology, or SDOCT. You can see the two images on the screen comparing the, the vast difference in resolution between the two technologies. Time domain OCT is slower and has a lower resolution and it's much more operator dependent compared to spectral domain OCT. The area scanned is also, also provides much more information for the spectral domain OCT. So it is a superior technology to the time domain by, by a wide margin. The OCT stratus, which is a time domain type of OCT, has two 
types of scan that are useful for glaucoma. One is the line scan, which examines the optic nerve head, and the other one is a circular scan, which scans the peripapillary RNFL. The six-line scan of the stratus OCT starts with the technician centering the scan over the optic nerve head. The machine then takes 128A scans along a line, and it does this six times. Uh, each individual line scan can be represented in false color, highlighting the different structures of the retina and optic nerve head. So the highlighted line scan is what appears on the printout, and you can choose which one you want to highlight. This is the image that appears on the screen for the guidance of the technician when centering and performing the scan. The circle scan, on the other hand, it also begins with the technician centering the scan over the optic nerve head. This time, the machine performs 256 or 512 individual A scans in a circular pattern around the optic nerve head. This is what it looks like to the operator. You can see that the distance of the scan from the disc border will vary depending on the size of the disc. So when it's a small disc, the RNFL being measured is further out as opposed to a large disc where the RNFL being measured is closer to the disc. So this is one source of artifact for the circle scan of the stratus OCT. So the results of the circular scan are analyzed and they are displayed as graphs and by quadrants and clock hours. They are compared against the normative database and the results are displayed as red, yellow, or green depending on how the patient compares to the normals. If it's green, then there's a 95% chance that that patient's measurements are normal. If it's yellow, there's a less than 5% chance of that patient being normal. And if it's red, then there's a less than 1% chance of that patient's results being normal. This is an example of a stratus OCT printout. So first you need to check the patient and exam data. Make sure that the patient's name is spelled correctly and that the birth date is correct because the patient will be compared against age match normal people. And the patient can also be compared against himself or herself in the future so the, patient's, the, the spelling of the patient's name needs to be correct. Next, you check the scan quality in indicators or the signal strength. So the higher the number or the closer it is to 10, the better the signal strength and the more reliable the scan. Then check the fundus image. Make sure that the disc was well centered within the scan circle and check how far the edges of the scan circle are from the disc borders because this is going to affect how you interpret the quadrant and clock R data and the graphs. The graphs, this is for the right eye, the left eye, and the two eyes uh, overlapped and so it should form a double or triple hump pattern that is within the green. That would be the normal result. The quadrant and clock R data are flagged red, yellow, or green depending on um, how close they are, whether they're normal borderline or outside normal limits. Then there are other parameters such as ratios of um, one area to another and averages which can be used for monitoring the patient over time. So this is what I was saying earlier about the age match database. If it's flagged as green then that's considered within normal limits meaning there's a 95% chance that that patient, patient's results are normal. 
If it's yellow, then that's considered borderline, meaning there's a less than 5% chance of that patient's results being normal. And if it's flagged as red, then that's considered outside normal limits, meaning that there's a less than 1% chance of that patient's results being normal. So the serous OCT is the Zeiss machine which uses the spectral domain technology, which is the one with the higher resolution, faster scanning, and which gives more data. So unlike the stratus, which where the scans are linear, where you have A scans lined up uh, or side by side, either in a circle or um, along six lines, the serous OCT provides a, an entire cube of data. So there is a test called the 200 by 200 cube. So 200 A scans along this axis and another 200 A scans along this axis. So 200 times 200 is 40,000 A scans covering this entire area. So that's why you get a cube of data. This is an example of the Cirrus printout. So first, again, you look at the exam, patient and exam data first, check for correct spelling of the name and proper birth date. Check the signal strength. Then the thickness map and deviation map. Then the RNFL and ONH parameters and the neuroretinal rim and RNFL thickness graphs and then the quadrant and clock R data. So first, patient and exam data. Signal strength is over here. This is how to interpret signal strength. 8, 9, or 10 are good. 6 and 7, they're not optimal, but you might still be able to use those results, but just interpret them with caution. A signal strength of 5 or lower is not reliable. Next, we need to look at the thickness and deviation maps. The thickness map shows the patient, patient's actual RNFL thickness in color-coded fashion. Thicker areas are hotter, are shown in hotter colors, and thin areas are reflected as cooler colors. So the blue areas are the thinnest, and the red or white areas are the thickest. On the other hand, the RNFL deviation map shows the patient's results as compared against the normative database. So deviation, because deviation from normal. So Abnormal areas are flagged in red or yellow, depending on whether they are borderline or outside normal limits. So you need to check that the two maps correlate with each other, meaning areas flagged as borderline or outside normal limits in the deviation map also appear thinner on the, thicker, on the RNFL thickness map. You this is an example of a focal RNFL defect that shows up well both on the deviation map and on the thickness map and also correlates clinically with the RNFL photo showing an RNFL wedge defect in the same area. As you get used to looking at thickness maps, you will become familiar with what the normal thickness map looks like for the different ages. So normally you should find uh, two, a bifurcated area of hotter colors superior to the disc and one large area of very hot colors inferior to the disc. But this tends to get thinner as we grow older and yet it will it may not be necessarily be glaucomatous or abnormal.
So it depends on the patient's age. The RNFL thickness map appearance depends on the patient's age. The last things we look at are the optic nerve head and RNFL parameters, neuroretinal rim and retinal nerve fiber layer thickness graphs, and the clock R and quadrant data. So on the left is a normal result and on the right is an abnormal result. The RNFL, the first thing you should look at in the RNFL and optic nerve head parameters is the disc area. So if you recall from my lecture on the optic nerve head evaluation, um, the, the size of the disc is very important. So because there's no normative data for disc area, that will always show up as gray in the color coding of the results. When the disc is large, such as in the example on the left, then the disc parameters will also be grayed out because the machine can't compare these to the normal database because there is no normal normative database. The RNFL, average RNFL thickness and RNFL symmetry will always have a color regardless of the disk size. So green and white are within normal limits. Uh, red and yellow are borderline or outside normal limits respectively. The RNFL symmetry is a measure of the symmetry between the two eyes and of course the with glaucoma it tends to go down and normal eyes will have good symmetry between the two the RNFL of the two discs. The value of the other measurements such as the rim area and the cup to disc ratios and cup volume are more valuable in terms of monitoring rather than as a diagnostic tool. So next you look at the thickness graphs. So you should see a double or triple hump pattern that looks similar on the two eyes and that falls within the green area or even above the green area. A little bit above the green area is still okay. In glaucoma, the RNFL thickness graph loses its double or triple hump pattern and it falls into the red and yellow areas. The latest software of the Cirrus OCT also allows us to look at the neuroretinal rim thickness in terms of um, and also compares it against a normative database. The thickness uh, can be is divided into clock R's and quadrants for easier comparison. And the clock R's and quadrants are also color coded for easy determination of normality or abnormality of the results. Another commonly used machine is the RT View. It's also a spectral domain OCT. And these are examples of printouts from that machine. So they have an RNFL analysis, an o com a combination optic nerve head, and RNFL analysis. Also, they also have a ganglion cell analysis, which they call GCC, or which stands for ganglion cell complex. And then they have the line scans, which are extracted from the cube. So the, you can just extrapolate how you interpret the cirrus to the way you interpret the RT view because they correspond more or less. So the RT view has uh, something that's similar to the RNFL thickness map of the cirrus. The RT view also has data presented in graphical form like the cirrus and also data divided into sectors like the cirrus, except that instead of 12 clock hours, they have eight sectors.
there's a new test available in the newer spectral domain OCTs and in the spectral domain OCTs with upgraded software and it's it analyzes the thickness of the ganglion cell layer in the macula so macular thinning in glaucoma cases was first documented using time domain OCT and well in glaucoma the first the ganglion cells are lost and we only look at the optic nerve because that's where we can easily see the loss of the axons of the ganglion cells so naturally the loss of the the pattern of ganglion cell loss is going to correlate with the pattern of RNFL loss and the pattern of disc damage and so now the newer machines they are able to because of their higher resolution they're able to map the ganglion cell layer so this is an example of the ganglion cell analysis from the cirrus on the left and the RT view on the right. So there should be a thick layer of ganglion cells surrounding the fovea in the posterior pole. And thin areas are flagged as a abnormal as borderline or outside normal limits in both machines. Since this is a relatively new analysis, the usefulness and how to interpret the pattern of loss is still, still not quite definite. And its usefulness is still uncertain so this is the area that we are looking at during a GCA or a GCC analysis the Cirrus OCT has progression analysis software which is called the glaucoma progression analysis this is similar to what's available in the other Zeiss Humphrey machine such as the Humphrey Visual Field Analyzer. So it uses trend analysis to identify whether the RNFL is getting thinner or thicker. It will flag the measurements as either possible loss, likely loss, or possible increase. Uh, you need a minimum of three exams to be able to do the GPA. You need to check that whatever loss is real loss for example in this patient where there has been possible loss identified the exam which had the possible loss has a signal strength of 8 over 10 as compared to the earlier two exams which had a signal strength of 9 over 10 so in this case it's possible that the possible loss identified is actually just decreasing signal strength and not necessarily true thinning of the RNFL. So you have to keep that in mind when analyzing the results of the GPA. So just like any other diagnostic test, there can be artifacts. So um, it's called algorithm failure when data from a particular area cannot be analyzed. So that shows up as black on the RNFL thickness map and as red or yellow a corresponding red or yellow areas on the deviation map sometimes the black area on the RNFL thickness map is because of blockage of the signal such as in this case of a vitreous opacity so the since the blocked area is in the area where the representative circular scan is taken then it becomes considered a zero on the RNFL thickness graph and is flagged as outside normal limits on the clock R analysis so that's an artifactual um, thinning
and not a real thinning of the RNFL. So the difference when it's blocked signal and when it's algorithm failure is that when it's algorithm failure, the area of the, the black areas appear more pixelated, whereas the um, when it's blocked signal, the black areas follow patterns of things that can really cause poor signals such as vitreous opacities, a wise ring, it follows the same shape or it, it uh, follows shapes that can occur naturally or because of disease. But more often than not, the black areas that you see on the thickness map are probably a combination of both algorithm failure and block signal. So sometimes it's hard to distinguish between the two. One of the advantages of the spectral domain cirrus OCT over the older time domain technology is that it does not require the technician to identify the disk border manually. It uses an algorithm. But sometimes that algorithm fails and you can have misidentification of the disk border. So on the OCT RNFL deviation map, the black line represents where the machine thinks that the disk border is. But this, in this patient, you can see that um, on the, from the photo that he has a normally shaped optic disk. So when you see a misidentified disk border, all of the parameters that depend on the disk border identification, such as disk area, the um, cup to disk ratios, and things like that, these are not reliable anymore. So you have to make sure that the disk border was identified correctly. Just like with some other diagnostic tests like the visual field tests, data entry, accuracy of data entry is important. So date of birth, if because the patient is compared to an age match normative database, if you input the, the wrong date of birth, then the patient is compared with normals who are either too young or too old. So in this case, the patient was compared with normals who were too young. So when they corrected the date of birth, then the results did not appear as abnormal as they did when the patient was compared with people who were, too, who were much younger than the patient. The next imaging technology we'll talk about is the GDX which is a scanning laser polarimeter. So it uses a polarized beam of light, which undergoes a phase shift after it passes through the RNFL. So a larger phase shift means that there's, it's a thicker tissue that the light passed through. So the beam of light sent out by the GDX is polarized in two different directions, which are perpendicular to each other. So that would be the yellow beam and the orange beam. So as that beam passes through the RNFL microstructures, the beam of light that is parallel, that is polarized in the direction that is parallel to the RNFL microstructures, that beam of light becomes retarded. So as it comes back to the direct, as to the detector, that parallel beam of light is now delayed compared with the beam of light that was perpen that was polarized perpendicular to the RNFL structure. And so that difference between the two beams can be measured. And the, th the bigger the difference, that means that the thicker was the um, structure that the polarized beams passed through. So you can see here the difference in the phase shift between the beams of light passing through healthy RNFL, deceased RNFL, and advanced RNFL with advanced disease. So it, the, the phase shift here is very, very tiny. 
this is an example of the GDX Pro printout. So just like in other diagnostic tests, check the patient and exam data for correctness. This is the fundus image, which is what the technician sees and what guides him. This is the nerve fiber layer map, which is similar to the RNFL thickness map of the cirrus. So hotter and cooler colors depending on how thick the RNFL is. The nerve fiber index and other parameters are shown here. The NFI is what's unique to the GDX, and the higher the number, the more likelihood that that patient has glaucoma. There's a deviation map, which is similar to the deviation map of the cirrus OCT, and an RNFL thickness graph, which is also similar to the thickness graphs of which can be interpreted in a way similar to the thickness graphs of the OCT. The GDX also has the GPA software because it's also made by Zeiss. So here you see uh, serial exams. These are the, the thickness map and the deviation map of the different exams. And this is the deviation from baseline. So changes are shown here. So changes are flagged with hotter colors when it's getting thinner and with cooler colors when it's getting thicker as the exams progress through the years. The next imaging technology that I'll talk about is the Heidelberg retinal tomograph which uses confocal scanning laser ophthalmoscopy. It also has a diode laser light source like the OCT, and it measures the reflection of light from various planes, and this is called the reflectance image. The planes are perpendicular to the optical axis. So the scan measures various planes that uh, take slices across the optic nerve head. So that's why this is called a tomograph. Because it's like, think of it like a CT scan. And um, the various planes are then combined. So these are the individual planes lined up and these are combined into a 3D map, uh, such as this one. This is an example of the HRT3 printout. So just like with the other tests to check the patient and exam data, this is the topography image where thinner areas are shown as hotter colors and thicker areas are shown as cooler colors um, on the optic nerve head. This is the reflectance image with the green check, yellow exclamation point, and red X of the Moore fields regression analysis. So the the more abnormal or normal the patient is, the, they will flag it with these symbols. Similarly to the other diagnostic or imaging technologies, there are RNFL profile graphs. But in the case of the HRT, the RNFL being profiled is right at the disc border as opposed to the other machines where the RNFL profile that they show is from RNFL measured further out from the disc. Um, you need to check the scan quality, make sure it's an uh, so, uh, um, exam that is interpretable or reliable enough. Then there are cup parameters, rim parameters, and RNFL parameters, which are also marked by the Moorfields regression analysis as to how normal they are or how abnormal they are. There's also an inter-eye asymmetry measurement where the closer the number is to zero, the more symmetrical the RNFL profile and the meaning the less likelihood of glaucoma, the more symmetrical it is. The newest player on the market of imaging machines is the Spectralis. It's a new platform and it combines spectral domain OCT 
with confocal scanning laser ophthalmoscopy such as what you find in the HRT into one machine and so there are um, certain advantages and certain features that can be had from the combination of the two technologies but because it's still relatively new and I am personally unfamiliar with this machine then the discussion of this machine will just have to wait for the future So the drawbacks of imaging technology are that it cannot stand alone, it's only an adjunct, especially when making the diagnosis for the first time. Um, there is a degree of intertest variability, meaning if you test that patient several times, even on the same day, using the same machine, there will be some fluctuation in the measurements. So the amount of fluctuation depends on the technology or on the machine. It's possible for there to be scanning artifacts, so you know th these aren't perfect machines. There can also be analysis artifacts, especially when the discs are unusual in shape or size or in patients who are outliers, meaning they're at the upper or lower ends of the normative database. So unfortunately, these are the eyes or these are the patients where we need the most help in diagnosis and these are the patients in whom the imaging technologies tend to fail us. And then another drawback is that these machines all use different technologies, so we can't compare the results of a patient's HRT with the results of his OCT. So if you are monitoring that patient using the OCT, then you have to keep using the OCT and using that same kind of OCT. So you can't jump from one technology to the other. And then um, all of these technologies use reference points to identify certain aspects like to identify the disk border or to um, identify where the RNFL starts. So um, the validity of these reference points is still not absolutely certain because they're sometimes based on very theoretical um, knowledge and then there is the problem of long-term follow-up because of the changing technology so if you were to scan a patient today using a serious OCT for example you cannot be sure that in five years you will still be able to scan that patient using the same serious OCT. So um, after some time these machines might break down and they may not be repairable anymore because the company that makes the machines is now using or producing a newer technology. So there is a limitation as to the long-term follow-up with these machines. So you need to keep in mind that the imaging technologies can be a good monitoring tool but they cannot stand alone as a diagnostic tool and you still need to consider the rest of the clinical picture when interpreting the diagnostic test results and you need to think of how you will follow up that patient long term so it's always important to have a proper documentation of the optic nerve head using photography because no matter how many years pass you will still be able to compare the, the photo to the actual patient's optic nerve. But there's no guarantee that you will still be able to compare whatever imaging test you did now with whatever is available in the future. Thank you for listening.